osteoporosis. The live disease-free diet is the very best diet you can follow when you want to recover from multiple sclerosis or any other chronic disease because the biggest cause of chronic disease are parasites, a parasitic infestation. And so when you follow a diet, and because I know it's really confusing to try to figure out what kind of diets would be helpful because there are so many different types of diets, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, but really the best diet to help you recover from chronic disease is a diet that greatly reduces the food to the parasites that are causing the symptoms and the disease, but this diet should also feed the body with a lot of nutrition. And so when we decrease the food to the parasites, they become less active, inflammation starts to go down, we start to have a lot of symptom improvements. This is called immune modulation. And that is why the Live Disease-Free Diet, which is a low-carb diet, is the very best diet to follow if you want to recover from any type of chronic disease. So what I'd love for you to do is type in your questions in the question box. I'm going to come back to those later. But in this video, I'm going to share with you the guidelines for the Live Disease-Free Diet. I'm going to give you lots of ideas on what you should be able to, what you can eat so that you'll have, be very clear on that. I'm going to share with you a lot of successes that our students have experienced. So this is a proven diet that really works. So you're going to hear successes, kind of like the symptoms that you can expect to experience if you follow this diet properly. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you some amazing resources so that they're free, and then you'll be able to start implementing the live disease-free diet and starting to have symptom improvements right away. If we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha, and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And I love talking about this topic because the best diet to recover from multiple sclerosis and other diseases, it's free. <laughs> like it's not something that you should have to pay for. And we have all the guidelines for free and I'm gonna go over them today because sometimes it's nice to look at written material, but sometimes it's really nice to get more clarity through people ask, answering your questions and just giving you some different ideas. So let's first talk about the guidelines. So with respect to the guidelines, I've got some really concise guidelines for you that I'll be sharing with you a little bit later on that you'll be able to access. But basically, the Live Disease-Free Diet is a diet that is lower in carbs. So the target is to get down to, for recovering from chronic disease, the closer you get down to 30 total grams of carbs, you'll notice really amazing symptom improvements. And this is called immune modulation. And again, the parasites will be less active. And then you're going to notice that symptoms start to improve because the inflammation starts to go down. The, your immune system doesn't have to work so hard. So the guidelines that I have are, number one, so we have the Live Disease-Free Plan. And the diet, the Live Disease-Free Diet, is the first step to recover. So again, you want to have symptom improvements right away. And that's the nice thing about the Live Disease Free Plan is that you don't have to wait until you start treating the parasites. You can start having symptom improvements in as little as one to two weeks when you follow the diet properly. And the diet consists of, so it, I should say it's low carb. It's not as low as the paleo diet. It is, sorry, it's lower than the paleo diet, but it's not as low carb as the keto diet. So... The difference, let's say, with Dr. Terry Wall's wonderful diet, um, which is more paleo, is that we're not having smoothies and we're not having alcohol and we're not having chocolate, just things like that. But we're getting the carbs down to a real target area of the 30 to 30, 30 to 40 total grams of carbs. Anything below 50 is helpful. But if you really want to hit that sweet spot, we found that it's between 30 to 40. And the closer you can get to 30 total grams of carbs, the more symptom improvements you will notice. And I'll share with you later what kind of symptoms improvements you can enjoy with this. So again, we are eating a lot of vegetables. And we're working, at, working up to 9 to 13 servings of vegetables per day. A lot of people are not used to eating a lot of vegetables. So that's why we have to increase based on, you know, some of us are really nauseous when we're sick, when we have different types of disease. And so we might eat like a bird or a sparrow. So you're going to just be starting to eat what you can. And 
If you have inflammatory bowel disease, it's very important to avoid any type of vegetables that would irritate. So you just eat the foods that agree with you on the shop, on the cheat sheet, I should say. Eat the foods that agree with you, and it's absolutely fine to cook your vegetables until the inflammation starts to settle down. So if you're one of those people that you get a lot of gas or bloating, or you just, you know, you just don't tolerate raw vegetables, you know that, or maybe you have inflammatory bowel disease, then just cook your vegetables until you start feeling better. So this could be oven roasting vegetables, sauteing, stir frying, or steaming your vegetables. It's absolutely fine. So the diet consists of having working our way up to 9 to 13 servings of low-carb vegetables, having moderate amounts of animal protein with every meal to maintain our muscle mass because we do take out or avoid all of the dried beans and the legumes, etc., because they contain car uh, carbohydrates like fiber and other carbs that we don't digest very well, but the parasites will. So this is why we want to eliminate any dried beans and legumes in the recovery phase. And then we eat enough healthy fats to maintain our weight. So maybe we're someone who can afford to lose a little bit of weight, then you just eat normal, add some healthy fats, and it's really easy to lose weight. This diet is very satisfying, so you're not going to be hungry at all. But if you can't afford to lose weight, because very often the parasites make it so that we're not absorbing our nutrition and we're a lot, um, we could be underweight. If that is the case, we just have to make sure that we are um, making sure that we're having enough calories per day. So as we decrease the calories from carbohydrates, we are increasing the calories from healthy fats. So that might mean we're having, you know, at least four tablespoons of healthy fat with a meal. And that can be butter, can be extra virgin, cold pressed organic olive oil. It can be coconut oil. Again, try to get organic and, and unprocessed or as unprocessed as possible avocado oil, but just healthy fats. And that really helps to give us the calories to maintain our weight. We cannot, if you don't want to lose weight, you can't skip meals. You have to, you have to eat a lot. You're just, and some people are like, I'm not used to eating that much, right? Because some of the low carb vegetables, they're bulkier, but they're not as concentrated as a sandwich, for example. So it might take a little longer to eat, but it's nutritious. That's where the nutrients are coming from. And also, uh, there, so the minerals, for example, will help to alkalize our body. And the parasites don't really like the fats as much. The protein, it's not their favorite food. Their favorite food are simple sugars and carbohydrates. That's why we're decreasing that in the recovery phase. So we call it sometimes the prep phase where we're getting ready to treat. This is truly a very, very important step because if you follow this low-carb, live disease-free diet properly, number one, you'll start to have symptom improvements within as little as two weeks, but number two, when you're ready to treat, you'll find that you tolerate the treatment so much better when you're treating the parasites, and you'll find they are much more effective so you can recover more quickly. We have seen crazy symptom improvements with this diet, and I'll be sharing those with you. So this diet is dairy-free except for butter, grain-free, so we're not having any grains. And I thought, you know, before I'm like, am I going to be able to eat that way because I, I'm s slim and maybe I'll lose too much weight? But no, you can maintain your weight if you eat enough calories. So it's grain-free, it's sugar-free, and dairy-free, caffeine-free, alcohol-free. But there are lots and lots of different foods we can eat, and I'll talk about that right now. I'll head over to the cheat sheet. So this is a cheat sheet that is available and we're going to be, um, I have a, a post on my website. If you go to livediseasefree.com, you'll find it there under evidence or under research. I think it's under research. And then you'll find the Live Disease Free Guidelines. There is a short video. It's less than three minutes that explains the guidelines and then there are the written guidelines. So to give you some ideas on what we can eat because it's like, okay, we, we know what we can't eat, but what can we eat? It's very, very important that we avoid all sugar, right? Because sugar is the, the most basic unit of a carbohydrate, and that is the most favored food for these parasites. They do eat other food, but sugar really activates them. It's like putting gas on a fire. And so 
all sugars are avoided. And we definitely want to also avoid any type of sweeteners because we want to get rid of our sweet tooth. If you get rid of your sweet tooth, you're not going to be a slave to it anymore. I have, I don't eat desserts. And so when we have meals with friends, et cetera, and if somebody orders, and a lot, of, a lot less people are ordering desserts, I've noticed over the years. But if other people are having dessert, maybe it's at Christmas or another special holiday, then I'm, I'm absolutely fine. What I love to have is just a nice cup of herb tea, which is caffeine free, not decaffeinated, but caffeine free. There are so many lovely teas. I'll talk a little bit about, actually, I'll do that right now before I forget. So there, one of my favorites is peppermint tea and spearmint tea. There's many different rooibos teas. There's ginger tea. There is uh, like a sleepy time tea. There, there are just so many. And we do have in the program, I just give you a much bigger list. You can, there's a company called Tega, T-E-G-A, and they have a caffeine, not a caffeine, yeah, caffeine free. And it's like an Earl Grey tea. It's an organic tea. So Tega, and it's an Earl Grey flavor. It tastes like Earl Grey with the different herbs they have in it. It's really, really lovely. So there's also raspberry leaf tea that will taste a little bit more like a traditional tea. So there's so many different teas and you're never going to get bored. And what I want to promise you is that when you make these changes, your taste buds will change and you will love this way of eating. You will love these teas. You won't miss your coffee anymore. I haven't had caffeine for years and years, whether it's through chocolate or through soft drinks or through coffee or tea. I just have taken it out of my life just because I knew early on in my recovery from MS that that was highly advised. We know that caffeine will stimulate parasites. So if you eat this way following the live disease-free diet, you'll have a lot of energy and you won't have those slumps where you need the caffeine. And so by avoiding caffeine, you just have a nice steady flow of energy all day. Um, and so my husband, even who doesn't have chronic disease, he's adopted that also because he just feels a lot better. So give it a try. But when we're coming off of caffeine, we can definitely have withdrawals. We can have headaches. What I recommend is for people to, when they're making their coffee, maybe if they're grinding up beans or whatever, just to use like half caffeine and half decaffeinated coffee beans or the grinds. And that way you're decreasing the caffeine slowly so you have less chance of a headache. But once it's gone, you'll find that you feel a lot better not having caffeine very important. So we want to get rid of the sweet tooth because we know that in the future, once we've recovered and we have our health back, we don't want to struggle with these cravings. So it takes usually seven to 10 days before the cravings are settling down tremendously. And we can really help the cravings settle down also by eating regularly. So with the live disease free diet, we're having three meals a day, we're having snacks, big platefuls of food, even when you're not hungry, eat. <laughs> and that is if you don't want to lose weight. I mean, if you don't mind, like there are some students that are like, oh, I would love to lose weight. And it's not our goal. Our goal is to recover from disease, but that's just a benefit from following this diet. And again, if you don't want to lose weight, you just have to increase the fat calories. So some people will, for example, they'll add MCT oil to their tea because it doesn't taste like anything. We have this wonderful mayonnaise recipe. So people will use different variations of it. They might use a spicy mayo with their meat. They might use a creamy dressing with like a Caesar salad type dressing with their salad. They might use a dip and make kind of a herb dip with their vegetables. That's another way to get extra fat calories inside of us. But those are just different ideas. So with respect to fruit, in the recovery phase, when we are recovering from a parasitic infestation, remember that parasites love sugar. They don't care if it comes from a cookie or some grapes or strawberries, the sugar in fruit will feed the parasites. So that's why we are decreasing the fruit intake while we are recovering. We're having one small serving of fruit about 30 minutes before breakfast. So that way the fruit is digesting in our body, in our stomach, and it's not going to ferment. Fermenting is basically when it's not fully digested and the parasites are thriving off of the sugar. So we want to optimize the digestion of it. That could be a very small kiwi or maybe like an eighth of a cup of berries, like strawberries. It's more like just a taste, right? If those, for us, we just love the taste of fruit. So it's just literally like a taste. Half a green apple would be another example. So a minimal amount of 
they still, these fruits still have sugar, but you're just not having as much. So you're having a small serving of lower carb or lower, lower sugar fruit. It's absolutely fine to have some lemon juice or lime juice on your salads. I personally, if you're recovering from chronic disease, I wouldn't be drinking lemon water throughout the day because you'll notice that although lemon is quite bitter, sour, and lime, that it still has a lot of natural sugar in it. So you don't want to be just drinking it all day long. It's super healthy, but just have it maybe on salads. Again, this is strategy. This is getting ready to treat by following the live disease-free diet. Uh, with respect to protein, the live disease-free diet really advocates for moderate amounts of animal protein with every meal. And so for those of you that are more plant-based, this diet is mostly plant-based. So like our plate is brimming with vegetables and we just have for women, maybe three to four ounces of animal protein for a man, maybe four to five ounces, not huge amounts. If you have a lar large amount of protein from animals with one meal, you may feel worse because your body can actually convert it to glucose. So excess protein intake, animal protein intake can be converted to sugar, make your blood sugar go up which will feed the infections, which will make you feel worse. And trust me, we've been doing this long enough to see that this really does impact students. So, but modern amounts of protein helps you to keep your muscle mass. And what we found with this diet is by having healthy fat and also the protein, the complete protein, that it really helps us to have more mental clarity and stamina and strength. It just really grounds us and it helps us to get past the cravings. So with respect to meat, you know, some people don't like pork. Pork is absolutely fine. If you like it, it's very cost effective, um, but it's nice to switch things around because that way you're getting different nutrients. So beef is absolutely fine and pork and fish and chicken and turkey, any type, even wild meats are fine. Please avoid processed meat. So with respect to bacon and ham and sausages, anytime humans get their hands on meat and they process it in some way, soaking it, in different chemicals and possibly adding a little bit of honey, a little bit of sugar. And, you know, I've purchased even, let's say, roasted turkey meat from the health food store and thinking, okay, this is a health food store, roasted turkey meat, but I'm so sensitive to sugar as far as I don't eat it. So when I eat turkey and I can tell if they've added sugar to it, and it just tastes gross to me because I don't like sweet turkey. <laughs> so just be really careful because even, you know, some things that are sold that are organic, they can have added sugar. So just eat, you know, the real meat that has not been altered in any way. Yes, hamburger, ground pork is absolutely, ground chicken, ground turkey is fine, but make your own sausages. Really easy to do. And I'll go over that a little bit later. Eggs are fine. So if you are sensitive to eggs or if you suspect you're sensitive to eggs, then avoid them or get tested. Um, there is a simple COCA test you can do at home, which checks your resting heart rate. If you're eating a food you're sensitive to, then your resting heart rate, when you wake up in the morning, it's going to be a little higher when you eat that food you're sensitive to. And you can test it over two or three times to make, I would say at least three times or more to make sure that it's accurate because sometimes even just thinking about something stressful can make your heart rate go up. But it is helpful or you can be uh, tested by different naturopaths, different practitioners can do um, energy testing or other testing for food sensitivities. But Avoid foods you're sensitive to, but a lot of us are not sensitive to eggs and they are really nutritious. Again, with all of your food, whether it's produce or whether it's meat or eggs, try to find produce that has been, uh, let's say it's organic, non-GMO, all of those things are really important, but it's not essential to recover from parasites if you cannot purchase all organic food. Um, so, but you know, the more that I'm learning about different things they're doing to our food that we didn't know about, you know, try to buy local, try to buy from places where you know how the animals were raised, how you know that they were processed, the produce where, if you know how it was grown. So right now we're into the summertime where we're starting to get in Canada, we're starting to get some really nice produce. We just purchase from local farms. We try not to purchase from we don't purchase from the large commercial grocery stores when we have all of that available for us in local farms. And also 
the farmer's markets are great. The farmer's markets can be a little bit more expensive depending on your city, but we just go directly to the farms because they're a little bit more cost effective and we know them and we trust them. Dairy, we avoid all dairy. This has been known for many, many years. I was diagnosed with MS over 35 years ago and back in the day, they knew that anyone who had multiple sclerosis or any other chronic disease dealing with candida or others, we avoid dairy because the protein in dairy is very similar to the protein in gluten and people are very sensitive to gluten and very sensitive to dairy when we have these parasitic infestations. And then also dairy has this sugar called lactose. And so that, that sugar can feed the parasites also. Butter is fine. Ghee would be even better. So if you take some butter and you melt it in a pan, you'll see it separates. There's fat and then the milk will be sitting at the very bottom of the pan. And so if you scoop off the fat, that is called ghee, and that's getting rid of any residual milk that would be left in the butter. But most of our students tolerate butter just fine. So with respect to vegetables, um, the ones that we're avoiding would be things like white potato and corn and peas and sweet potatoes, any type of carb that you know is kind of comfort food and it really helps to fill you up. So again, white potato, corn, sweet potato, yam, but we also avoid legumes and dried beans and peas because all of those are higher in carbohydrates and then we're just not gonna notice any symptom improvements. Again, they're healthy foods when eaten in the right proportions, but when we're recovering from these incurable diseases, which are not incurable, but it's just caused by parasites, we have to make the life for these parasites inside of us a little bit miserable. We're not gonna be able to kill them because our body will maintain a specific glucose level so they're not going to die, but they're going to be a lot less active when we get the carbs low enough. So if you're eating things like potatoes and corn and peas, you'll find you cannot get your carbs down to 30 or to 40 total grams of carbs per day. But it's absolutely fine to steam, saute, oven roast, and stir fry the vegetables that agree with you. That can be things like the green and yellow string beans. It can also be like bok choy, su choy, like the Chinese vegetables that are lower in carbs. It can be asparagus and broccoli and cauliflower, cabbage and Brussels sprouts. There are so many different vegetables that we can eat that are absolutely fine. Cucumber, celery. When we're having things like carrots and avocados and tomatoes and peppers, those are allowed on the live disease-free diet, but we're having smaller amounts of them because they are higher in natural sugars and carbs. So tomatoes are a fruit, and if you're not sensitive to them, having a couple of slices on a large salad is fine, and it just adds flavor, and it just makes things interesting. Adding a little bit of chopped carrots is fine. Same thing with like beets, like if you were gonna have uh, the beets, which are a root vegetable, any root vegetable will be higher. So a little bit of grated beet on a salad, a very small amount, or a little bit of carrot. Avocados, they are higher in fat, but they're also higher in carbohydrates. So if we eat, let's say, a half an avocado, that can be many, many calories, and then we're going to run out of opportunity to eat other vegetables for the rest of the day. So maybe one or two slices of maybe a quarter of an avocado on a large salad. Just dice it up a bit, put it in the salad. It gives you some variety. Uh, be very careful with nuts and seeds. That's what I wanted to mention because there are certain nuts and seeds we should avoid. So for example, peanuts and pistachios, they're usually higher in mold content. And most of us that are most if not all of us that have chronic disease, we are dealing with fungal overgrowth in our body. So although the mold that would be growing in these nuts would not cause an infection in us, our body is sensitive to fungi when we have fungal overgrowth and it could benefit the fungi that's living in us. So we definitely don't want to stress our immune system out anymore or benefit the infection. So peanuts and pistachios are out. But it's absolutely fine to have very small amounts of things like walnuts or, and just be careful, it's good quality. So for myself, we just buy the nuts and they're not always great at Costco, but wherever you can find the best quality nuts, you don't want to eat rancid. I always check, for example, with pecans, I always check, I'm eating raw pecans. It's absolutely fine to soak the nuts overnight, but when you're recovering, have a very small amount of the nuts. Let's say have 
you know, a quarter of a cup or an eighth of a cup. And if you have that once or twice a day, mid morning, mid afternoon, one or two times, if you're improving with your health, if your symptoms are getting better, it's fine. But if you're not improving, take the nuts out and you'll probably find that you start improving a lot better. But make sure that if you notice any of the nuts or seeds have black on them, that is mold and that is not good quality. Or if they taste rancid, don't eat them. They should taste fresh, fresh because they can carry different types of mold. Vinegar. So the only vinegar that we have while we're recovering is apple cider vinegar, if you like it. I personally enjoy fresh lemon or fresh lime the best on my salads. I still do. I don't really love the flavor of apple cider vinegar. You can have it if you like. But I mean, I might add it a little bit with some lemon juice and some apple cider vinegar if I'm making a really big salad for a lot of people and, and they just love it. But I personally prefer a little bit of fresh lemon or fresh lime juice on my salads. It's a lot tastier for me. There is a nice herbal seasoning that I wanted to mention before I forget. It's called Herbamer, herb a -mer. And you can usually find it in local grocery stores and health food stores. You can find it online. And it's a really nice seasoning salt. It has a blend of the sea salt, but with also different herbs. So it adds body to different dishes that you would make. All right. And alcohol, we avoid all alcohol. Alcohol is a mycotoxin. It's made by yeast. It is a carcinogen. It is a, you know, it causes cancer. And when we have these infections in our body, we already are dealing with a significant amount of alcohol from the infections in our body. And we definitely don't need to add any more insult to injury for sure. So we avoid all alcohol and let's see, yeast products. We avoid all yeast products again, because we are dealing with fungal overgrowth and we just, number one, don't want to stress the body out anymore. And we don't want to benefit the fungal overgrowth. The grains, it's important to just maybe mention, so we're avoiding things like pasta and rice, but also grains like amaranth and also uh, millet and uh, chia seeds, flax seeds. We're avoiding all the different types of grains because even if you took, let's say, flax seeds and you soak them, you'll notice, or chia seeds, you'll notice that there's like a, a very thick um, material that comes when you're soaking these seeds and that is like carbohydrates, right? So that is a sign that, you know, those are carbs and that it's going to feed the parasites in our gut. And these parasites are microscopic. They don't need a lot of food. Very, very small adjustments make all the difference with the live disease free diet. So again, the target is to get to nine to 13 servings of vegetables a day. And that equals about three platefuls of vegetables per day. And if you're wondering about a serving, um, like what we usually say is it's, it's similar to what Dr. Terry Walls is like three platefuls of vegetables. And if you're losing weight, make sure your platefuls are really large and that you're adding a lot of healthy fat. And what I do is like you might add some, have some butter on your meat. Uh, see, you can even do like garlic and different herbs in your butter, which tastes really good. You might use mayo like spicy mayo, you could use chimichurri sauce. We've got a, a recipe on our website for holiday meal ideas. You can probably just even look up live disease free and chimichurri. And that's just like a bunch of fresh herbs put together in a little bit of oil. I think it's olive oil and maybe a little bit of lemon in it. Delicious on barbecued meat or any kind of meat. So you're going to want to make sure that you're having that healthy fat to maintain your weight if you need to maintain your weight. And we originally said 50 total grams of carbs, but we have found that getting down to the 30 to 40 total grams of carbs, closer to the 30, if you're really sick, you're going to find tremendous, tremendous benefit. And before I forget, I just wanted to mention too that, you know, when we have these parasites, we're usually dealing with gut issues. It's either diarrhea or constipation or a combination of both. We might have constipation for a few days and then it switches to diarrhea and then back and forth. Bowel incontinence is also really common. So when you are starting to change your diet and you're decreasing the carbs, uh, what we want to do is we want to definitely make sure that we're having daily bowel movements. So this is where it's important to use a supplement to help you to have a daily bowel movement. The constipation is caused by the parasites. And so when you're taking something like 
what are what's the most popular for our students is oxy powder by global health you'll find that on our website livediseasefree.com under shop you'll see a direct link there and whether you take one two or three capsules before bed it helps to promote a bowel movement there's also vitality capsules if that's not enough but most people find that the oxy powder is enough so getting the bowels moving is really important because if your bowels are not moving then the toxins are building up in your intestines. They're crossing into the blood. They're moving throughout the body. Your liver is trying to detox it, but sometimes can't keep up. They're crossing the blood-brain barrier, and they're causing things like depression and anxiety and terrible brain fog and memory issues and on and on. And so that's why it's really important. Like we're decreasing the carbs, but we want to keep things moving, right? And before we start treating, we want to be having daily bowel movements. We don't want to be killing the parasites and having them rot inside of us. We want to get them out as quickly as possible. So the target is 50 total grams of carbs per day. You can use the chronometer, which is a free app on your phone. And that includes when you're measuring, uh, using the chronometer, make sure you're measuring the total grams of carbs, not the net grams of carbs. The difference being that total includes everything, fiber, sugar, carbs, starches, everything. Whereas the net grams of carbs will omit for sure fiber. And so if you just measure the net, you'll say, oh, wow, I'm, you know, 35 grams of carbs and I'm in the target zone. But if you miss the fiber, maybe you're over 50 then and you really don't notice a symptom improvement because you're like, well, I'm following it and I'm not noticing symptom improvements and I'm in the target zone, what's wrong? It could be that you're just measuring the net grams of carbs and not the total grams of carbs. Very, very important. So again, if you don't want to lose weight, you have to increase the calories per day, three meals, two snacks. It might take a little bit to get used to. Some of us are used to eating two meals a day. We might eat a lot during those times and we might do intermittent fasting. We don't recommend that while you are getting ready to treat or treating. Once you're well, if you want to intermittent fast, that's fine. But if you keep the carbs really low and then you just only do a couple of small meals, you will lose a lot of weight and that's not good. So the key is to just basically figure out, okay, this is my age, this is my gender, this is my activity level, so this is how many calories that I need per day. So ha at least half of my calories should come from healthy fat. And then we have a, a way of measuring all of that in our program, the Live Disease Free program, but I'm sure you can find it online too, just how to convert you know, so many calories into fat because there's so many calories in a tablespoon of fat. And then you know how many tablespoons of fat. But I would say it would be at least four at least four tablespoons of fat and you might want to do more with each meal and what we find in our students is that their cholesterol normalizes their blood pressure normalizes so i've been eating two eggs in the morning for years and years and my cholesterol is wonderful so cholesterol in food is not going to cause cholesterol issues the reason that we may have cholesterol issues is that a lot of these parasites, they can live in the linings of our blood vessels. And when they do that, then that causes inflammation. Inflammation is our immune system attacking those parasites in the lining of our blood vessels. And so our body will produce cholesterol in response to that inflammation to try to protect the lining of the blood vessels. So what feeds parasites is carbs. So as we de decrease the carbs, the inflammation goes down and then people find that their cholesterol normalizes. And also there is a lot of misinformation about cholesterol. Um, we have some, we follow more of the current research, not the old research that really promotes the cholesterol lowering drugs because they're very, very toxic and they're very hard on our bodies. So um, that Dr. Perlmutter is a great resource for that information. I'm trying to think who else, probably Dr. Mercola also, but Dr. Perlmutter is a real expert in that area. He would definitely be one. And I, th I think that Dr. Mercola did some kind of a chart on cholesterol, or maybe a few of them got together doing that. So that's very old school is like high fat diets cause cholesterol. No, because even family members that I have that had high cholesterol, they would go on Atkins diet, which was high fat, and they would find that their cholesterol would normalize. So that was just maybe more to promote the <laughs> certain medications, I would assume. And so it's very important to choose food as close to its natural state as possible. So if you are 
you know, getting any type of meat, get roasts or chicken or ground beef or etc. pork, different types of pork if you like it, fish, alternate the fish. Unfortunately, our oceans are quite toxic right now. So the fish is, are quite toxic also. But just really avoid sausages and anything that's been processed, like even ham, bacon is notorious for having sugar in it. And those little bits, small amounts of sugar in things like ham and bacon, you will notice that your neurological symptoms will still be there and they will be aggravated by it. And we have seen this over and over again. All right. Avoid foods that you're sensitive to or that you're allergic to. And I think that's it that I wanted to share. So the healthy fats, organic, cold pressed, non-GMO, extra virgin if possible, olive oil and coconut oil and butter and avocado oil. There, You'll find that there are some other different types of oils that you can find in health food stores, like even walnut oil can be really tasty on a salad. But just make sure again that they are cold pressed, meaning that they're less processed. We, want, we don't wanna have trans fats, extra virgin, organic, all of that stuff is important for the oils for sure. And you can find a lot of that in places like Costco even. So very, very readily available. So that is the cheat sheet and the short video will be on that link. So every week, or I should say most weeks, we, we publish a newsletter. And on the newsletter, I'm covering a different topic every week. Next week, I'm going to be talking about is multiple sclerosis an autoimmune disease? So maybe you don't have MS or maybe you do, it doesn't matter. So we're gonna be talking about what is the evidence that autoimmune disease is really a thing? That all of these different labels, there's over 80 different autoimmune diseases and they're supposedly all unique. So are they really unique? Is there really such a thing as autoimmune disease? And so I'm gonna provide a lot of information watering it down, not watering it down, but making it simpler so that you can understand. And I think you'll be quite upset when you see this because it's like all of this is really leading us to these this sickness industry where we are using immunosuppressive drugs because we all have autoimmune disease instead of treating the cause which are infections. And the research is really showing that the greatest trigger for autoimmune disease is infection, is parasites. So Stay tuned for next week, same time, I'll be going over that. And I really hope that you share all of this information with others because that is how we're gonna bring change. So let's talk about meal ideas. So I'm a creature of habit, most of us are. We're really busy and I'll just tell you what I like to eat. So in the mornings, I usually have different types of greens in the morning. So um, this morning, we actually finally have local greens again. So I just steamed a bunch of spinach that's grown in the dirt. It has a lot more flavor than those little containers, but I have eaten the stuff in the containers, you know, in the dead of winter. It's nice to have that versus nothing. So spinach, not every day, but I'll have spinach. Arugula is really nice, especially just check the leaves, like if they are in the little plastic containers. Any type of greens, make sure they're not rotting. So you have to inspect them very carefully and you usually have to eat them fairly quickly if they are in those little plastic tubs. Don't eat greens that are rotten. The rotten part, that is different types of bacteria that can make you sick. So make sure that what you're putting in your mouth does not have, it's not rotting. And that includes even garlic can have, it's funny, but garlic can actually have worms in them also, like the little filarial worms. I saw a video years ago about that. So just make sure that um, you're switching up the different greens, so you're getting different nutrients. And like if you're having spinach all the time, you might get a little bit more oxalic acid, which might be a little bit harder on your thyroid, especially with the parasites. A lot of people have issues with their thyroid, but steaming those type of vegetables, so steaming spinach is helpful. But there's baby kale or else even just fully grown kale. If you get some that's more tender or you can saute them, there's also collards, there's bok, um, not bok, bok choy is great too. You can stir fry bok choy. You can make a stir fry for breakfast or you can have a stir fry for supper and then you can just have extra for breakfast. You can make, if you don't like eggs, you can have, and that's what I have, a greens with extra virgin olive oil and a couple of eggs done differently. Could be flipped over, sunny side up, could be boiled, it could be scrambled, it could be an omelet, but 
If you can't have eggs, then what a lot of people will do is they'll just use some leftover protein from supper, or they might, on a weekend, they might just make up a batch of homemade sausages. And there's lots of, you can just look up whatever spices you like. There's, you put hot, hot pepper flakes in it. Some people like coriander, cumin. Um, there's so many different spices that you can put in. You can put in dried mustard, not all of these together, but you'll find recipes and you'll see what, you'll know what spices you like and you can make a bigger batch and you can just freeze it. So you can make like little patties or you can form them into a sausage shape. I would think probably the patties would be easier or round like meatballs. And then you can just have them readily available. Uh, curries are great too. So whatever you like to have for flavors. With this diet, really rely on fresh and dried herbs to give you the flavor that you want. So you can have all of the different types of, again, the cori, the cumin, the all of the different flavors and curries, the Italian spices, the oregano, basil, thyme, rosemary. I actually planted for the first time in a couple of years because we were in transition, but I've planted some herbs and just absolutely so excited to get into them. We do have local farms that grow a lot of herbs, so I always get fresh herbs, but it's nice to have your own for sure. And I like to freeze dry the herbs because it's just something, um, I'm freeze drying different things, but the herbs are amazing, especially things like rosemary because it's so hard. And if you freeze dry it, it's just really, it's the same size as when it's fresh, the same flavor, but it's just crumbles so easily. And um, my son-in-law, who's a chef, he's absolutely loving the rosemary that he got for Christmas. And I gave him basil and a whole bunch of other herbs too. So really rely on different herbs and turmeric is really great and garlic and ginger, fresh ginger, like get one of those uh, zester graters. It looks like a ruler and it's just, um, you can just run over the garlic or you can run over the ginger over it or turmeric. Just be careful of turmeric because it's, it's, it stains incredibly easily. So keep it on the cutting board and your hands, you know, might want to wear rubber, rubber gloves because your hands will be very, very orange. But all of those flavors just add so much. And then with seasoning mixes, I like to look for recipes. I just do, let's say, chicken rub. And I'll find some recipes. And then I'll just pick ones, a recipe that has a lot of good reviews. And then I'll make a bigger batch of it. So it might have some onion powder and it might have some different herbs and salt, etc. And then I have my own blend of herbs and then I will use that on the chicken. I've got uh, Herb Provence that I just made my own. Just throwing, you don't have to, you can buy Herb Provence too. Just make sure that when you read the ingredients that it doesn't have maltodextrin, it doesn't have fillers, etc. in herb blends for seasoning. So you can, like the safest is to buy your own or to make up your own seasoning by mixing things together. You can make your own taco seasoning very easy to, again, just mixing a few herbs together, making a little bit of a bigger batch, putting it in a little jar, labeling it, and that way it's really easy. Like if you're cooking up some meat and you want to have some taco seasoning, you just throw that on, or chicken rub or beef rub or whatever. So there's so many different flavors. And I can't remember the name, but you might even be able to find that in certain cities, like I was in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and there's this spice company. You can order it from online also but they have so many different types of blends of herbs and spices and it's very pure. So that is a kind of place that I would definitely trust and just like very unique flavor. So use those kind of things. So whether you're oven roasting or you're baking or you're barbecuing, frying, whatever you're doing, just use a variety of herbs to definitely prevent boredom. And so Italian spices and curries are fine and Greek spices are great. So uh, there's all different ethnic groups and you, Mexican, I love Mexican, the cilantro and the lime and all of that is just absolutely amazing. So that's how I prevent boredom. And when you get in the swing of this, this diet is really easy. You just cook a little bit extra so you have leftovers. So you're not cooking all the time. That's what we do. And that way we can have, we cook enough so we might have like a lunch and then another meal during the week. And then you might build up a couple, three things and then you don't have to cook for a few days, right? And you can make a huge salad that can last. And right now the lettuce is grown more locally, so it's going to have a lot more flavor. 
So it's just a really great time. And even things like the bok choy is so amazing now. And yeah, we're just starting to get into the vegetables that are grown local and we're starting to grow our own again too. We're, we just did some peppers and some tomatoes and we are just gonna, we're just putting in some more beds for lettuce, etc. So breakfast, I like greens and eggs, or like I said, you can use any other kind of meat or make it, making up your own sausages and freezing them and just use, taking them out easily. For lunch, I like to do a big salad. So that's usually, I, I really like romaine, but leaf too, whatever looks good that we're purchasing. And so it'll be leafy green, a plate full. It takes a bit to eat it. And I will just put garnishes of, for sure, cucumbers. And I like onions. Uh, I like to do sweet onions that are not too spicy and hot, but it's a garnish, right? And then I'll add a little bit of uh, peppers, just a small amount. I don't like a lot of pepper on it. It's too sweet for me. Again, you get rid of your sweet tooth and then you don't really appreciate it. Celery is great to add on. Uh, I'm trying to think a little bit of tomato or a little bit of avocado. And then I just drizzle the olive oil. So I'll just drizzle it like this and then I'll drizzle it in a different direction. And there will be olive oil and lemon juice left on my plate when I'm done. And I will scoop it up with a spoon because I want the calories. And olive oil is pretty expensive these days anyhow. So to maintain our weight, again, we have to concentrate on eating enough, right? And so as we're decreasing carbs, we have to substitute that with something. And the fats are very rich in calories so we have to decrease as we decrease the carbs we're increasing our fat calories we avoid different whey products and smoothies because whenever you grind up fruit or even carrots etc you are processing the sugars you're making them so that when you drink the drink the smoothie your blood sugar is going to go up and that is going to feed the parasites throughout your body and they do not need three meals a day. So very important to avoid all smoothies. Do not process your meals. If you are on, let's say we've had some students that are on, um, they're in a hospital or a care home and they might not be able to swallow. Uh, that's something that comes with advanced disease. So then it is absolutely fine to, to um, process your vegetables, et cetera. So, but then what you would be doing and you just would add your animal protein and the low carb vegetables and a little that healthy fat and you would grind it up and it turns into like a cream soup. So if you can't swallow, you can do that and it'll still be low carb. You're using all the low carb vegetables and even things like cucumber you can put in, but spice it up with things like you might like a ginger soup or you might like a dill soup, like to have different flavors, a garlic soup. Um, but just use different flavors to spice it up. But the rest of us, for breakfast, we are chewing our food because that really helps to detox the brain. Very, very important because we do have infection in the brain when we have neurological diseases. And even things like migraines are finding lesions in the, in the brain of people that have migraines. And that is pockets of inflammation, which are pockets of infection. So we definitely want to keep our carbs steady down and we want to make sure that we are chewing our food to help detox the brain. So again, the live disease free diet is a little lower carb than paleo, but it is higher carb than keto. And with keto, you can have dairy. And with the live disease free diet, we're not having dairy products except for butter. Again, it's very important to avoid things like chocolate. We avoid mushrooms. So any fungal different types of uh, uh, fungal foods like mushrooms. We avoid all the fermented foods, so the kimchi and kefirs. We avoid kombucha. We avoid all of that except for the raw sauerkraut because there can be natural yeast occurring in those other fermented foods. And again, if you are going to introduce any type of raw sauerkraut, homemade or store-bought, make sure to start really slow. So some of the questions, I'll go a little bit more quickly here to finish it off. So some of the questions, do I have to eat this way forever? And the answer is when you start really following this diet, you will love it. It is anti-aging. You will have so much more energy than you ever had. So you'll love this way of eating. It tastes so good. And you'll once you've treated the parasites really well, 
then you'll find what works for you and you will increase the carbs back a little bit, but you're not going to go back to the old way because the old way helped to bring you to this place of chronic disease. And the difference between calories and carbs, again, so carbs come from different types of fruits and vegetables. There are no carbs in meats and fat. And calories is what you need for energy. So you can get calories from carbs and you can get calories from fats. And we are decreasing the calories from carbs and we are increasing the calories from fats to give us energy and to maintain our weight. All right, I think I've carried everything. So with respect to uh, a lot of people ask about, you know, is it okay? Like, I, ca I can't eat meat. I cannot eat animal products. I'm vegan and I'm not against the vegan diet at all. And I totally understand if you can't or you choose not to eat any animal products, that is your own choice. I totally understand that. But to be honest, we have not found that it is very easy to treat a parasitic infestation at this time when we're just solely eating the vegan diet. So our students that are vegetarian, if they add in a little bit of eggs and maybe fish, possibly chicken, they're getting enough protein, they're maintaining their muscle mass, and they're still eating mostly vegetables, like heaping plates of vegetables, and they are fine. But if we take out all of the animal products, and if we also take out all of the dried beans and legumes, and we're taking out all of the grains, and we're really limiting sugars, a person would fade away just eating low carb vegetables and very minimal fruit and very minimal nuts and seeds. And you, it wouldn't be a healthy diet, right? You'd be missing too many nutrients. So unfortunately, we discourage the vegan diet until you're well. And maybe things will change. Maybe we'll have a bunch more doctors and researchers that are really finding better ways to treat the parasites more effectively and taking it on. But in our experience, and we've worked with hundreds of people, at least a thousand people or, and more, very like in a very, you know, not intimate, but like a, a, we're working closely with them for three months and longer. And we have found that anyone who attempts to just follow vegan, like I won't even work with them right now because I don't want to see them suffer and I don't want to put them in that situation. So it's unfortunate because they thrive on carbohydrates and a vegan diet is really high in carbs. But I mean, you can still, if you're following vegan, you can still decrease all the processed carbs for sure. But there again, then it gets to be more difficult to maintain your weight and to, you know, we're not going to digest the, the beans and legumes very well. All right. So what do our students notice when they follow the live disease free diet? It is absolutely wild. And it's not just our students, but I've done videos on the diet, on the live disease free diet, and people are reporting back to us all the time that we're not even working with. And they're like, this has changed my life. Like just the diet alone has changed my life. So this is something that you can do right away. You can start to implement. You can start feeling a lot better. I have all the resources for free for you. So our students notice that within one to two weeks, they start to have more energy. Their brain fog starts to clear their they're, they're able to think more clearly. They're able to remember things better. Their bladder really improves. That's one of the first things that improve is bladder function. And when they're not getting up so many times throughout the night, they notice that they're able to sleep better and then they have more energy. So it all kind of lines up together. So they're sleeping better. They have more energy. They're happier. They start to feel kind of like their old self. Their spasticity can decrease, pain can decrease, numbness decreases, tinnitus can decrease, vision improves. We've even had at least four students quite recently over the last few months here that had diplopia, which is double vision. And just with diet, that corrected. Again, inflammation is going down because the parasites are less active. They're producing less poisons. The immune system is working less. And then people are noticing life-changing improvements. They have more strength. They're able to walk a little bit better, especially with less spasticity. And they're less bloated. Their digestion starts to improve. So anxiety is another big thing for some people. Anxiety will really decrease. So there are huge, huge benefits to this diet. And it doesn't take long if you get, and it's just all about getting the carbs into the target zone. Like 
as close to 30 total grams of carbs as possible. So I will go to your questions. I think I've answered all of the common questions that I have. I'm just going to go to your questions right now. And then I will finish off with just letting you know where all the resources are. All right. Hello, Maurice. Please do because you're tired of MS. You're very welcome, KF. You are raw and vegan, L Pokey 25. I, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that because like I've tried working with a couple of people that are vegan and it's, it just, you can see it doesn't make sense if you're taking out grains and you're taking out a lot of fruit and you're taking out all of, all of the grains so we're eating no grains and then you're not having beans and legumes, there's not much left to eat and you will fade away to nothing. Uh, so what I would consider is, you know, like if you're, if you're dealing with chronic disease and your health is not getting better on the vegan diet, I would consider, if, if possible, trying to look at the live disease-free diet for sure. So KF, you follow the diet and you can now handle the heat. That's huge. I didn't add that as one of the symptom improvements. So the parasites, they make us so, and they're very sensitive to heat. And so when it gets really hot and we get hot, they react in us and we can have a lot of awful symptoms where we do not tolerate heat. So he, so KF is noticing that he can handle, or he or she can handle the heat. Awesome. You're very welcome, George. David, um, could I possibly eat nine, um, I how could I possibly eat 9 to 13 servings of vegetables a day? So this comes with practice, David, and you don't have to start with that, but you'll find that if you're following this diet and if you're not eating a lot of vegetables, you'll find that you'll lose weight. And if you don't mind losing weight, you will get to a place where you won't want to lose weight anymore, but you'll just notice that you're having, and actually that is recommended by the USDA website or the USDA website is having nine to 13 servings of vegetables a day because the nutrition in our food has decreased so tremendously. Hi, Jan. What about decaf tea? So that's a really good question. So decaffeinated tea or coffee, it still contains caffeine. And so we avoid all decaffeinated, but we can have caffeine free tea, um, which are a lot of different herbal teas that are caffeine free. We would definitely avoid caffeine uh, decaffeinated coffee or tea. The parasites are very, very small. They do not need a lot of caffeine to get them going, and we definitely don't want to get them activated and hyper inside of us from the caffeine. Jan, let's see, David, you watched a lot of my videos. Very grateful. Thank you so much for your kind words. And I just want to thank you for all of your kind words. This is a lot of work. To me, this is really a mission, and I'm on a mission <laughs> to bring the truth out. And like the, some of the topics, it is by the grace of God that we're doing this. Like, yeah, I have a science degree, and I have many years of teaching and coaching experience, but I'm not a medical professional. And I have so many medical professionals that take my program because they can't get well with our standard of care. And the topics that we're bringing out, the insights that I really believe is divinely inspired, is really helping us to kind of go, okay, wait a minute. I had blind faith in our system. I totally trusted and believed that they had our best interest at hand. And I do believe probably a lot of doctors do, but they don't know what they don't know. But at the very top of this whole system, they do know. And they do know that parasites are causing all chronic disease, but there's no money, there's no financial incentive to treat the parasite. So that's why we're suppressing the immune system for the rest of our life. And it's it's an awful way to live. We become disabled, we die early, we miss out on our life, and that is not the answer. So just as we've gone through the last few years, since about 2019, and you know what happened and how all the corruption is really starting to come out right now of, of how long ago they knew about, um, and they were working on this. I'm not even going to say the names because I'll get censored, um, but it's all coming out, and this has been going on in the sickness industry for many, many years. It's really unfortunate. And I, I really hope and pray that the truth comes out in my time, that the doctors will take this over and help people 
early on when they are just getting a diagnosis to help them to treat parasites and get on with their life and not have to deal with suffering and disability like many of us have had to do. Hi, Jan. You drink flavored, decaffeinated, and non-dairy creamer. So this is where, you know, like if you're quite sick, you might want to start to make changes because it's going to make a big difference. So decaffeinated will still have caffeine in it, will still act, make those parasites more active. And then non-dairy creamer, I'm not sure how many carbs in it. I don't know if it's natural, if it's kind of chemicals. Sometimes some of these non-dairy creamers are fairly laced with a lot of chemicals. But otherwise, the carbs is really important to track. This is a Facebook user. What about oatmeal and brown rice? We avoid all the grains, which are oats and millet and amaranth, rice, all of those grains, and quinoa even. We're avoiding all of those as we are getting ready to treat and as we are treating. And then once we have recovered, you can start bringing them back in. And if you've, if you've treated well enough, you will tolerate the, the different carbs again, for sure. Hi, Dee Dee. Um, would an extended water fast also work to kill the parasites? No, because your body will maintain a specific glucose level in the blood to keep you alive. And that is enough to keep the parasites alive also. So it would be really nice, but it is not going to work. Eugene. This goes against everything you've learned. Yes, I know, and I'm really, really sorry. When I was first diagnosed with MS, I got the Dr. Roy, uh, Dr. Swank's diet book, which is, again, really talking about the opposite, right? And so there are a lot of different, even for people that have cancer, they're saying, no, 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 you can't have meat. It's really bad for you. Obviously, you want to have different types of meats that are non-GMO, but that's with everything. You want to avoid GMO. You want to know where your food is coming from. But whatever meat agrees with you, again, it's whatever food agrees with you. It is absolutely healthy. If you have parasites, what is what is really true is that parasites thrive on carbohydrates. And all chronic disease, the biggest cause of chronic disease are parasites. So when you eat a lot of carbs, you're feeding the parasites and you'll notice that you're not going to feel any better and you could possibly feel worse. When you decrease the carbs, just try it, right? There's nothing to sell here. Just take the guidelines, follow it and, and just implement well for two weeks. Do a trial for two weeks, but follow it the way I have it laid out. It will be life changing for you. And then you'll go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was possible and then learn more about the parasites. And then once you're at that place where you're like, okay, I need to treat the parasites also because I want full recovery. I want to recover as much as possible. Then you also need to treat the parasites because if you're, they're living in you and you're following the diet, there is no diet that will get them out of your body. You have to treat them. So that's important. You're going to also treat, but the diet is the first steps. So Karen, we would avoid all mushrooms, all fungi, different types of fungal products, because, um, again, our body is dealing with fungal overgrowth when we have a parasitic infestation and our body is sensitive to the fungi that's there. And it's just been known since I was first diagnosed that when you're on it, like even a candida diet, you avoid all of the foods that are from fungi. You love herb mary. Yes, it's a great seasoning salt, very safe. Karen and Facebook user... Yes. No, I haven't got the cookbook. <laughs> the cookbook is a really big project. So I have to literally, we were in transition. I have to get testing done and I have to get photography. And it's just, I'm doing so much research. It's, it's a big thing. So we are going to, I'm just not sure. I honestly need somebody to take that over for me, honestly. Karen, um, you have lichens, multi, uh, multiple forms. Is this an autoimmune or even or keen to get it sorted and keen to get it sorted? I don't know if they call it autoimmune, but it just means that you are dealing with a disruption to the microbes in your body for sure. And then you're dealing with this condition. All conditions is a disruption in your microbiome. And it's never just one microbe that's out of balance. It's very often we have worms. We have protozoa, which are single cell parasites. We have fungi, we have bac 
bad bacteria, disease-causing bacteria. Sometimes it's present in smaller amounts, but when it gets to be really populated in our body, then we end up with disease. And I'll be talking about that next week. Hi, Dan. You just noticed this. You're late. It will be recorded. Bananas, at least five teaspoons of sugar in a banana. So we would definitely avoid bananas. Um, and that's another thing is that, you know, I'll see people that are just recovering from cancer and they're drinking these smoothies with bananas and tons of fruit in them. And I'm like, do you realize that you're feeding the infections that if there's anything left in your body, which usually there is, you're just like activating it again, right? So there are TED Talks. This is not something I've made up. There are TED Talks that you can look online on YouTube where they're talking about um, low carb, low sugar diet is vital for cancer. Do hospitals know that sugar feeds cancer. And even for diabetes, like there's a, one doctor on YouTube, I believe it's a TED Talk also, Dr. Sarah something, and with her patients, her diabetic patients, she's so excited because it's old, old video, but she found that she could just help her patients so much by decreasing the carbs. Diabetes is also an infectious disease. So decreasing the carbs really helps all conditions. Yeah, so avoid bananas if you're deal if you're wanting to recover from chronic disease. Bananas are great for potassium, but they're really high in sugar. Hi, Jen. Dark chocolate, you love it. Yes. So it in the recovery phase, there's too much sugar even in the 90% cocoa dark chocolate. And there's caffeine in it too, so it's gonna stimulate the parasite. So it's interesting how many people that have MS, including myself. I had chocolate in the fridge and I ate a little bit of it every day. It's almost like the parasites make us eat foods that benefit them. And it's almost like we're slaves to them. Eugene, what about people in a wheelchair who can't cook like MS, um, you are not able to cook for yourself? So I'm not sure if you are in a home. If you're in a home, very often you can give these guidelines to the kitchen and then they will just give you the foods that are on that will agree with you and they'll avoid foods that don't agree with you. If you are having to cook for yourself but you're struggling with it, look for places where people volunteer that will come out and maybe, so you can prob probably have groceries delivered. So this is where you're going to pick the foods that you can eat and have them delivered. And it's absolutely fine. Sometimes you can get like these bags of cut up vegetables so that you can just, or frozen is fine too. Some people live in remote areas and frozen vegetables are fine. So you can just oven roast them. You can throw a chicken in the, in the oven. Um, so it doesn't have to be really fancy. It doesn't have to be a lot of work. But if we are quite disabled, then often we need to have a little bit of help. And there are people out there that will help you, but you just have to reach out to them for sure. Yeah, so definitely bananas are out on the healing stage. Way too much sugar in them. And Lola, hello. Karen, I don't think almond milk. Yeah, we would skip almond milk and soy milk, all of those different things because you'll find that it's quite challenging to keep the total grams of carbs low enough. And so if you are having anything like, like um, could be rice milk or almond milk, that will uh, even coconut milk all of those things are going to give you calories carbs i should say they're going to give you carbohydrates and it's really challenging to keep the carbs down to 30 to 40 total grams of carbs per day so i'd rather you eat something like broccoli or cauliflower or something where there's more fiber and there's more nutrition when you're to to use up the carbs for sure all right, I'm going to have to let you guys go because we've gone on a long time. There's still more questions. Just go ahead and type your questions in the question box. I will definitely answer them. So resources for you that are free. Number one, there is the Live Disease Free Diet Guidelines on our website, and there's a short video on our website under research. Then you'll see in YouTube, there's a playlist, of, and I talk more, but I didn't even talk about what I eat for supper. Supper, it's usually some kind of animal protein, which is barbecued, oven roast, oven baked, etc. And then also I like cooked vegetables with supper. So a couple of servings of cooked vegetables. If I'm still hungry, I'll have some extra greens. 
And there you go. That's what I, I, I'm a very simple way of eating. But there's things you can do. You can do taco salads. You can do different types of stews you like that are with low carb vegetables. Um, I'm trying to think just simple things on the barbecue. Again, chimichurri and the herbs and spices and garlic and all of that is so flavorful. Hamburgers. Um, you can use, you can do, um, what do you call that? Uh, the Greek souvlaki, you know, on a, the meat on a stick, whether it's lamb or chicken, like all those beautiful flavors. So there are so many things you can eat. And then the salads, you can vary them also. You can do Greek salad, you can do Caesar salad, you can do other salads. Um, be careful with cabbage. Don't have tons of cabbage because cabbage is a little higher in carb and you'll find that that isn't going to agree. So cabbage is fine to have in smaller amounts. Don't eat like three cups of uh, Brussels sprouts, you'll notice that the carbs add up a lot to that. So this is where you use a chronometer and you can kind of get a sense like, oh, I didn't realize there were that many carbs in that vegetable. So I can eat them, but maybe I'll have a half a cup of Brussels sprouts and not three cups of Brussels sprouts, right? So that can help you to get into the target zone. A um, couple more quick questions. So what is your opinion of zeolite? So the zeolite is a great binder, but a lot of the zeolite products are contaminated with aluminum. So you have to be very careful the source that you're getting. There is one that has been touted by Dr. Klinghart as being safe, which is zeobind, zeobind, which you can find on biopureus.com. But I don't really recommend a lot of zeolites because I don't know a lot of the companies if they are safe or not. And if, you know, getting some extra aluminum in our body is not a good thing. So again, the diet is on our website, livediseasefree.com. Start to implement it. Follow it closely. Follow the steps that I have laid out. Watch my videos and make up a plan of what you're going to eat. Notice symptom improvements. Learn about the parasites. And then if you need help, if you need support in treating them, we have a proven plan called the Live Disease Free Plan. And if you, are, if you need support in treating, because it's something that's unfortunately a lot of our doctors are not skilled at yet, then make sure to watch my masterclass training to learn more about the steps we take to recover. So the, this diet is the first step. It's crucial, first step. But there are other steps, right? And we also need to treat. And so that's all in my masterclass training. And then if you're like, Pam, yes, I want your support, then after you watch my masterclass training, you can fill out a form and then you'll get an email. If you're ready, you'll get an email with how to book a time in my calendar and you can get all your questions answered. You can get started very quickly and recovering. Again, diet is a first step. It's not the end all be all as far as recovery, full recovery. Like you have to treat the parasites also. But this diet is the one that will help you to have the most symptom improvements to also help the parasite drugs to work and the herbs to work better for you. And then also to help you to tolerate them, right? Because you want, you don't want to just be taking small amounts like, oh, I feel terrible. You want to be able to feel well and treat more quickly and get on with your life more quickly. So that is my hope for all of you. And that's why I'm doing this work is that I want you to know there is a better way to treat all chronic disease, including MS. There is a best diet for MS. And the reason being is that this is the only diet that really considers the cause, which is parasites. So watch my masterclass training if you are ready and you need support. Otherwise, if you enjoy these educational talks I give, please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next week with Is MS an Autoimmune Disease? Take care. Bye-bye for now.